This is called Sighing Down the Wind So Sadly. The fall rain is hitting the window next to me, and the tangled trees bare of leaves mock my dread as the sky slips tonight. The bar I am sitting in is sparsely populated, mostly drooping men alone, posted on stools and evenly spaced for elbow room. There are two women in the booth behind me discussing what he said. He said something to the one, and the other couldn't believe it. I didn't notice as my waitress, with a belly like the bow of a ship, approached to take my empty glass. I was busy wiping the steam from the window and looking for her. In a voice of despairing tone like bagpipes, she asked if I wanted another. I nodded, and she disappeared into the smoky distance. I started to gaze into the slick and empty streets again when I was momentarily distracted from my longing by the jukebox kicking in the stones, no expectations. As it tore through the smoky black sadness of the bar, I watched as some of the drooping men took notice, except for the guy behind me who wished loudly that they would turn it down, as I wished I had an extra pamphlet on euthanasia. It didn't matter, though. All I could think of was my girl. She was leaving today, going back to Berlin, a night flight to the fatherland. I wish I was going with her, returning to that city of sinister kinkiness before dawn like a vampire. I love that city where even its shadows seem artistic in expression. And as much as I denied it, I loved her even more. I wish I was, I wish I was there leaving her love behind instead of here instead of her here leaving my love behind. New York would certainly take its toll on me this winter. When the waitress returned, I was once again wiping the window with the side of my hand, and suddenly she was there, fumbling with an umbrella in the streetlight that revealed the severity of the storm. I leapt up, banging my knee on the table, and shot for the door, leaving my waitress confused as I cut a path through the swirling cigarette smoke. Opening that door for her, I was opening a scar for myself, we returned to the table through the prying eyes of solitary men, and I wiped the rain from her cheeks. Christiana Gableman of Belzigstrasse Berlin was beautiful on levels too numerous to mention. She ordered a beer with a curling smile. I looked into her face and felt that everything was something, even if in the peripheral the mudstorm kept blowing up against the window panes. Christiana had green eyes of optimistic innocence and an angular face full of spirit, full of spirit and expression. Her thoughts were delivered in poignant words through one of the most beautiful smiles I've ever seen. The slender hand she used to point at me the night she met to say, you like me, huh, was now moving her henna hair from her expressionless face. The way she looked at me was not the same and would never be again. The likable badness she'd accepted when we met was wearing as thin as the ice I was skating on in life. We talked about the old times and avoided what was happening now. What was happening now was her getting out. She couldn't watch me go down. I remembered, a ye I remembered a year into our relationship when she uttered those three little words all women did at some point. You're killing yourself. That was the summer I spent with her in Berlin. Even Berlin summers were forbidding. We spent, we spent the few days of sunshine at the city pool that resembled a Fritz Lang nightmare. We sat drinking Eastern Bloc champagne while the ghastly pale residents of that sector dipped themselves. I came home on a flight paid for by her, missing the fall of the wall by a month. On the plane ride home, I dozed and dreamt that I was a child taking a train home with the bodies of faceless loved ones in the last car. Over time, my heart that was the softest flint going into the relationship had softened and destroyed by my own excesses. That year, we corresponded through letters and mixtapes full of Lee Hazelwood. Then she returned to the city to me, and I began to believe life was possible, even though I knew I always lost the people I cared for the most. I tried to stay clean, I tried not to push her away, but winter was returning to kill me, and my nights thundered with the roar of chemical experiments and overindulgence. She was always there for me, she loved and trusted me, and I her, but I didn't trust myself, and so a cornucopia of tragic events had brought us to the table in the smoky bar for the last time. I paid the check and we walked to my apartment for her bags. As Christiana walked through the room, she started to cry as I put my foot over what looked like the final rent notice slid under the door. Walking out through the dark corridor of my building, she made me promise to get clean and write her, both of which would fade in time. On a train full of homeboys, we huddled and with my arm around her and at her gate, we kissed and then she was gone. Returning to the city, I wanted only to fall into bed and not wake up, but as I approached my front door, I found it had been padlocked. I banged on the landlord's door and no one answered. 
Hating life, love, and myself equally, I reached to my pocket, counted my money, and spent every dime I had on a bundle of dope. When I came to, it was dawn, and I was on an empty A train in Far Rockaway. I walked sick and cold to the frigid beach till the rains came and swept me away. Thanks. Nine minutes. Um, this is called a containerized asylum. I, I lived on the Bowery for a while. The end of the gun that makes your adrenal gland expand is twitching a couple inches from my forehead. I know the piss-eyed Shylock holding it is not going to use it in the confines of this Bowery flophouse, but the rock cocaine making his handshake and the faultiness of the simple cocked mechanism does have me tingling. I let him know I'll have his money and I'm about to close the door when I hear Rick's longer leg scraping its unlaced sneaker. I peer down the decayed hall to see him passing through the light of Smitty's television like a moth. His flimsy shirt is buttoned a few holes down with a triangle of thick hair bushing out to remind me of vintage porn. His sleeves have dried and caked bloodstains, giving his shirt the appearance of a war-torn flag. Some of the fresh stains tell a different tale. He's lit and looking for calm and clarity. Paranoia visits him nightly like a ghost from Dickens. Do you hear police radios, he asks, while thumbing the pages of his book? I assure him that police footsteps moving with meaning have a distinctive sound. This is the third time he's done this coked up twinkle toe dance through my room tonight and I slam him out the door. I sit on my bed and fix what I have left. The point is blunt and move the, moves the vein sideways before breaking through with a pop and a deluge of red. Laying back, I survey the room, if you could call it that, this Bowery hotel room, a tiny cubicle of cheap wooden plaster walls that don't go all the way to the ceiling. Like the fire pails of stagnant water on the wall, these cubicles are buckets full of stagnant people going nowhere. Filth rounds the corner of my steamed windows and I can see the snow hitting the glass and accumulating on the ledge. As I creak open the window, the cold feels good as the oppressive heat exits quickly. The snow is too heavy to gray on the filthy streets of Chinatown. Enormous flakes are swirling under a street lamp, the beam providing a view of Possum Mike, the rodent-faced Jesus freak, babbling to a Chinese girl who's wedged against a bus stop wall, smiling and nodding nervously. You've been cornered by God, I scream, and close the window. What a brave new world. I think about Stan, who died one week ago in two rooms over. After days, they found him as dead as Caesar, doing the mortal coil shuffle. His savior plucking him like the last candy from a decrepit box of samplers. Rick is spying doe-eyed at Bob, who is brandishing a kitchen knife as dull as his wit. Bob is a squat, squat red-faced hick with long, stringy blonde hair, giving him the, uh, the look of a rejected almond brother. Smitty is refusing to turn down his radio and laughing off the theatrics with his whisper voice and metal Lark Lemon smile. Rick, let's go, I holler, pulling a bent cigarette from my soft pack. I inform him that this show plays three times a night. While Bob, who always pulls up lame, stares intently at me, I slide by his exaggerated butter knife and fleshy exterior on mock tiptoes, my hands in the air, laughing my way down the stairs. The fluorescent flicker gives the lobby an eerie glow. Jimmy, the night manager, is pulling heavy on his viceroy and trying to get a homeless guy with frostbit feet to put his shoes on and go. Jimmy's an old Burmese man with a blank face and a passion for Ovaltine. He has, a tr he has trusting eyes and a scene too much. He'll nod and listen, but he'll never get taken. I tell him it's a red wine night, and he agrees. Rick and I stand under the awning, plotting where to cop. The silence of the snowstorm is causing a low tone sonic wave and mixing well with the neon buzzing. Large flakes are falling with severity and the cold is rouging up my cheeks. Only shadows of brown glazed ducks hook through their eyes, pattern the snow through the light pouring from the steamed restaurant windows. My Shylock is fumbling with something and doing the shimmy before finally falling. Too cold to be walking these streets. The local Asian shopkeepers eye us with contempt as shysters, boosters, and junkies. I know better than to frequent any of their stores. Just as my coke euphoria is turning to sour discord, I watch a panic woman in black as she runs with her umbrella, the snowflakes flying off her turtleneck, skidding on high heels to snatch a cab from a pair of hapless drunks. The wind tears through my jacket with laughable ease. Still trudging, we spot some clown without a state plate stuck in the snow. 
He removes his hat in frustration to reveal his bald, perplexed head, my snicker flying high over his shiny dome and drifting into the night. We offer to help him for a price. He agrees, and with the aid of some cardboard, he skids off on his ways. Just as his taillights swim into the shifting flurries, we find someone open, dealing from a doorway. I enter Rick's room as he unwraps his many layers of ill-fitting Goodwill clothes. He dumps his shit in the cooker, using the empty bag as a page mark in Henry Miller's air-conditioned nightmare. Back in the room, looking up at the ceiling, I hear the distant strains of slow jam R&B mixing with local television. Then, with the window cracked, I nod off, a chance to dream. I hear the mild cases of delirium of liver-pickled men pouring through their keyholes, their screams wafting around this containerized asylum. Life should be like my dreams, I think, as I watch a puddle of water form under my defrosting shoes. Thanks.